The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. And I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, too. You could say I'm Jeffrey's conversation partner today. We're going to be talking about psychic social psychology. I imagine you're probably asking yourself already, what in the heck does he mean by that? Psychic social psychology. Let me start with a simple example. I've told this story before, but it bears repetition. Many years ago, when I was a college student at Berkeley, Arthur C. Clarke came and spoke at the student union and uh, after his talk, I raised my hand. This is in the mid-1970s at a time when he had been in the news for, amongst all things, debunking the news reports concerning the claims associated with Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic. So, after his lecture, I raised my hand and I said, Mr. Clark, do you believe in ESP? After all, he'd written many novels like Childhood's End in which ESP actually is uh, integrated into his plot line. And uh, I thought his answer was very telling. He said to me, no, I do not believe in ESP because I don't want anybody to read my mind. And of course, the audience laughed. <laughs> it seemed funny at the time, but there was a deep truth involved in that. Arthur C. Clarke at that moment said one of the most honest statements I have ever heard any skeptic ever make about the field of parapsychology. Of course, he didn't want people to read his mind. And I think if you study his personal biography, uh, you'll see that he had reasons for that, uh, which are really irrelevant to our discussion today. The important point I want to make here is that Arthur Clarke was speaking in terms that would be fully recognizable to a Freudian psychoanalyst. Freud's entire theory is based on the idea that all of us have things going on in our subconscious mind that we would prefer not to be aware of. We don't want to know what's in our own mind. That, in effect, is the very basis of Freudian defense mechanisms, which are the foundations for Freud's theory of neurosis which he attributed to virtually everybody. <laughs> so, I think it's fair to say that even the most open of us have hidden secrets, you could say, things that we would prefer to remain private. They're nobody else's business and the idea that somebody with psychic capacities can look and see our deepest secrets, the things that we are the most ashamed of, the most embarrassed about, the things about us that are most socially inappropriate. Freud also wrote another book called Civilization and Its Discontents, in which he pointed out that uh, in order for uh, us, us humans, biological creatures, to become civilized, we had to accept certain uh, ground rules for civilization, uh, the Ten Commandments, so to speak. But the Ten Commandments are not in accord with our own urges. We have aggressive urges. We have sexual urges that are not socially acceptable. And that's the essential tension of civilization to which Freud wrote about uh, very eloquently. So, the very first thing we can say about the 
psychic, social psychology is, is that we all have motivation to live in a world where people are not psychic. There are moments in which each and every one of us would prefer to be in a world where psychic functioning is impossible. And frankly, that includes many of the best psychics, and remote viewers, and clairvoyants that I've ever known. Nobody is immune from the desire to have some privacy, some aspects of your life that only you are aware of. That's natural and normal. And uh, Arthur C. Clarke expressed it perfectly. Now, you're entitled to ask yourself at this point, well, so what? What does my desire for personal privacy have anything to do with the reality or non-reality of psychic functioning? It's either real or it isn't. And uh, whether or not I desire it to be real shouldn't matter. But here's the rub. It does matter. There's a great deal of research now in parapsychology. One of the strongest effects we know was pioneered by Gertrude Schmeidler at the City College of New York, where she was a psychologist. And I've talked about it before. It's known as the sheep goat effect. Sheep are people who believe that they can perform successfully in a parapsychology experiment under rigorous, double-blind, well-controlled conditions. So, there's no ambiguity uh, about it. And goats are people who, who believe that it would be impossible for them to do that. And not surprisingly, over and over again in parapsychological tests, sheeps perform better than goats. In fact, uh, it's ironic. I'm pretty sure the research will show that goats score closer to chance than would be expected <laughs> according to the laws of probability. So, the suggestion is that goats are receiving psychic information and then blocking it subconsciously. So, there are these subconscious dynamics that affect our ability. Now, on the larger cultural scale, we know that there's a lot of, I guess the best word I could give it is suppression of psychic functioning and psychic knowledge in our culture. I am the living representative of that suppression because over 40 years ago in 1980, I received a doctoral diploma in parapsychology from an accredited American university. The University of California at Berkeley. And subsequently, unfortunately, I'm very lonely in this regard because there hasn't been a single doctoral diploma, to my knowledge, and I would love to be proved wrong on this, a doctoral diploma, a piece of parchment that says parapsychology on it, offered by an accredited university anywhere in the world to my knowledge, either before or after. I have to add an asterisk here because I really owe a lot to the community of people doing parapsychology research, hundreds of people doing it, many of whom were doctoral level students and did doctoral dissertations on parapsychological topics. Unfortunately, they didn't get a diploma that said parapsychology on it. Typically, it would say psychology. I think it's possible that some diplomas coming out of Edinburgh and England might say psychology and parapsychology, which is nice. And I don't want to go into the fine points right now of why I think parapsychology should be recognized as a unique discipline with its own history separate from experimental psychology. 
uh, that would be another conversation. But I do want to talk for a moment about the importance of parapsychology experiments. And uh, in a previous monologue, I talked about Pierre and Marie Curie, two great scientists who received the Nobel Prize for their discovery of radium and how they worked so hard to sift through tons of uranium ore or pitch blend to come up with a tenth of a gram of pure radium. Uh, but here's the point. You see, they were both engaged in what was then known as psychical research, the field that preceded experimental psychology, or excuse me, experimental parapsychology. Psychical research began in 1882 in Britain. There were also active organizations in France that the, the Curies were involved in, and they would sit with mediums in seances, essentially observing what, what they could see. And Pierre Curie was very, very enthusiastic about the uh, things he had witnessed in seances with Eusebia Palladino. And I am just going to, for uh, benefit of those of you who may be interested, I'm going to link to a previous interview about the work of this extraordinary woman who was uh, 19th century, early 20th century. Marie Curie, who is a little more hard-nosed than her husband, uh, put it this way. She says, it doesn't become scientific at all until I can reproduce it in the laboratory. So, she was not prepared to go as far as her husband in endorsing the, the kind of phenomena. And uh, the point I'm trying to get at is that when it doesn't happen in a laboratory, when we're talking about psi, psychic functioning, psychokinesis, mind over matter, precognition, clairvoyance, retrocognition, etc., healing, when these things occur in normal daily life, which is the, the way they're occurring every day uh, for people, you can never be quite sure if it's real. There will always be alternative explanations. Always. After all, you can always <laughs> fall back on, this is just one of those things. It's a rare event that occurred. And we don't know how it occurred, but certainly wasn't paranormal. However, when these events occur in the laboratory, we're able to measure them. We're able to control for all kinds of artifacts and uh, conflicting interpretations or confounding interpretations, interpretations that would cloud the results, can be controlled in a laboratory experiment so we can have a much higher degree of confidence in what we see in the laboratory. That's why the sheep-goat research is very important. At a larger scale, I often imagine what would the world be like if everybody believed that this stuff is real, whether they like it or not. And that's one of the reasons ultimately that we're putting out so many videos about paranormal phenomena on this channel. It is to have an influence on the large-scale conversation that is going on. And it's my belief, I can't call it a uh, fact, I could call it a hypothesis. It's my hypothesis that as more and more people in our culture become familiar with the data of parapsychology, that the phenomena itself will increase and be more visible and more detectable even in the laboratory let alone outside of the laboratory. Of course, outside of the laboratory, there are many ways in which individuals can deceive themselves about who is psychic and what events are psychic. I should do another monologue just on that, but uh, let me say simply that there are many, many ways uh, in which human beings can fall into traps of uh, logical inconsistencies, self-deceptions, and basic human foolishness. Uh, that, that is very real. But at the same time, we have very good examples 
that lead me to conclude that the more and more that this information gets out into the public, the more and more we are going to see successful psi performances in the laboratory and in the culture at large. And here's my key example. Prior to 1954, when Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile running, it was considered an impossibility. Nobody had broken a four-minute mile in uh, athletic events for generations. Yet, when Roger Bannister did it, it only took a very short time before several other elite athletes were able to accomplish the same feat. Today, it's nearly 80 years later. The world record in the mile is 3 minutes and 43.3 seconds. In other words, the impossible barrier of the 4-minute mile has been broken by nearly 17 seconds at this point. And there's every reason to think that new records will continue to be set for a wide range of athletic events. Once athletes understand that something is possible, that it has been accomplished, that there are training methods that work, why they all jump on it. And new records are broken in athletics, particularly in track and field. Uh, year after year after year. I have seen world records broken here in Albuquerque at the uh, International uh, Indoor Track Meet, for example. I witnessed a world record being broken just a few years ago. The difference, of course, between athletic performance and psychic performance is that we don't have, I'll call it the Arthur Clarke factor going on in athletics. It doesn't intimidate people. It doesn't run up against our defense mechanisms that an athlete should be a great performer. But I can imagine that if we lived in a world where people with psychic talent were given the same incentives and training and social support, uh, support from their friends and their families and their colleges and their cities and communities for psychic performance, the way we reward athletic performance, we would also see ongoing improvements. To be honest, we're a long way from that point. We're not ready yet. <laughs> We're not yet even granting degrees in parapsychology. But it's my expectation that at some point in the future, somebody watching this very video is going to realize that the day that I'm describing today in the, in the year 2023 is about to become a reality maybe before the end of this century or early in the next century, it could happen that soon. So, let me leave you with these thoughts. What are the ways in which you would prefer to live in a world in which psychic functioning never can occur? What are you trying to hide from the world? Not that you have to tell me, but it's good for you to know, for your own benefit. Do you think you would be comfortable in a world in which more people all the time are engaging in real psi activity? If the environment for psychic sociology were to change and to become more favorable, would you be okay with that? I'll leave you with those thoughts and thank you for being with me. Indeed, thank you for being with us. Thank you.